a simple parental act. It was a religious act. It was a spiritual act that was laden with, with religious and spiritual meaning at a level. Simeon is there in the temple. Simeon was a devout man, eagerly awaiting the redemption of Israel. And God had promised Simeon that he would not, he, Simeon, would not die before seeing the Savior. So lo and behold, he sees Jesus and in a flash realizes the Savior and proclaims what we know as the song of Simeon. Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. Accord. And that's just a fancy way of saying God, you have kept your promise. You see, God always keeps God's promises. God never threatens. God only promises, and God's promises are good. I suppose that Mary and Joseph were spiritual people, certainly a spiritual child. I mean, that's sort of obvious if he's the Savior, if he's God's son. So what was, what was the point? What was the point of presenting Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior, in the temple? It was his already. Well, two reasons. The first reason is that for first century Judaism, the temple in Jerusalem was the only, the only meeting point between God and those who were Jews. If you wanted to see God or be in God's presence, you had to go to the temple. So being good Jews, Mary and Joseph brought their Jewish son, Jesus, to the temple to meet God and have God meet him in a very uh, religious way and a rather redundant action, uh, should truth be told. But the prediction of Malachi and God's promise to Simeon were fulfilled in this coming to Jerusalem. Again, Luke underlines God keeps God's promises. There is, though, I believe, a second reason that lies a bit under, and that is a reason that is pertinent for our age when so many people are struggling to find the meeting point between spirituality and organized religion. Luke puts Mary and Joseph and Jesus in the very center of the reality and religion. Luke is telling the reader, you and me, that you can be as spiritual as you want to be looking at sunsets or reading uh, crystals or anything else. Whereas we heard last Sunday in the Radical Love live podcast here at the cathedral. Your spirituality is whatever you follow. Your spirituality is whatever you follow. Go look at your check register and see what you follow. In describing the simple act of bringing a child to the temple, Luke presents us with a most existential question about our own spirituality and our own practice. First, the first fact is that if one's spirituality is without form or shape, just to be spiritual is basically like eating a banana split. It looks good, it tastes better, but in the end, they're all empty calories. A lazy spirituality lulls us into believing anything is okay as long as we nod our heads and tip our hats toward a larger power so that we can get on with real living. A healthy spirituality enables a person to meet the challenges of life and change and grow as one faces those challenges realistically. Joys and hardships, temptations and downfalls. And a living, real spirituality gives power to deal with our fears, our failures, our successes. 
a lazy spirituality tells a person that she needs, you need more power, you need more spending power, you need more control over others. A lazy spirituality seduces us into thinking we don't have to care about the beggar at the Broadway. We don't have to care about families celebrating the Broadway anyway. We don't have to worry about abused children, homeless people, starving people. They're all far away, and it doesn't have anything to do with us. And that lazy spirituality might work. It might just work until the coronavirus shows up, reminds us exactly how interrelated to, with one another we actually are. Now we are here in this great cathedral, built not by people who were simply religious, though they were, but by spiritual people who were dedicated to a particular discipline of Christianity, a specific called Anglicanism or the church within the path of Christianity. The Anglican the Episcopal tradition is both spiritual and religious, disciplined and free all at the same time. For, spirit, for spirituality and religion and discipline are not mutually, mutually exclusive as popular. What does this mean for those who seek to be disciples in these days of shrinking religious practice, declining numbers in every direction. We need, as a body, to do some things. We need, first of all, to be more intentional. We, Anglicans, Episcopalians, Christians, we need to be more intentional about of our members in the traditions and the intellectual property of being Episcopalians and Christians. And we must form our youth and ourselves in order that as the challenges to the church and the Christian faith well up in this 21st century, and they will well up, we as a church can face them and move them into the future with hope and confidence and facing the challenges before the church. We'll need to be bold witnesses to what we believe or what we doubt we believe. We need to be clear and disciplined as we present in the 21st century our hopes, fears, the trust we place in God and the trust we place that God will fulfill God's promises. This church, the Episcopal Church, the Anglican tradition, every church, every tradition, will be called on to clarify its values regarding the treatment of the poor, how we deal with the forgotten people, how we treat the refugees, the poor and forgotten people, our Christian values of care for all of creation, one another and every human being and our own nation and wor world must be honed and honored lest we be led down paths of selfishness and self-centeredness and xenophobia and fear and hatred of our neighbor. We must be clear that we value freedom, and equal justice for all as laid down in our Constitution and Declaration of Independence. We must be clear that we believe in the inherent right of every human being to adequate food, shelter, medical care provided free and equally for all. It's the hard work of witnessing in this century and in this moment in our life as a nation. The role of this cathedral is to lead this city 
and to lead the nation through our witness and service, I invite you to come to this cathedral with your spirituality, whatever it is, and be open to having your spirituality, my spiritual, our spirituality be formed and shaped and empowered. Let us come here to learn to trust God's promises. We at the cathedral need to think about the ways of presenting the Christian faith in new ways that appeal to and, com and confront a skeptical age. <coughs> it is the cathedral's role, neighborhood, to serve this nation and the world with vigor and clarity, sharing our resources liberally, liberally and the traditions of our faith with the world hungry and thirsty, not just for any spirituality, not just the banana split, but for a spirituality and a religion formed by the faith and practice and discipline of living and appropriated for living with strength and hope and trust in God for this coming century. Amen.